So good morning, everyone. And thank you for all of those that have joined us. Um, and we would love to hear uh, where are you joining us from? At the moment, it seems that the chat function may be disabled, but we still love for you to tell us um, on the Q&A button, uh, your name, the organization that you work with, and where you're coming from. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Gloria Geraldo. I'm the new advisor for non-communicable diseases and mental health for this regional program for the Caribbean of the Pan American Health Organization. We are part of the Inspire Partners, and we're delighted to bring along with, with all of our partners here today, the third part of the series of webinars on the Inspire strategy. Um, if you have had the chance to participate in the previous two sessions, we had a session in November of last year. We had a session May 11th, and today's session finalizes um, the, this round of webinars. And um, we hope that they truly inspire all of you to continue to be in touch, to continue to um, move forward this important work. And these have been introductory webinars with the basic uh, strategies of Inspire. So I'd like to first invite some of our um, Inspire partners this morning to greet you all. And I would like to start by calling um, Catalina Fernandez uh, from UNICEF Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Please, Catalina. Uh -huh. Thank you, Gloria, and good morning, everyone. And getting from UNICEF Regional Office for Latin America and Caribbean, and thank you all, all of you for joining us in this second day of work on workshop. And we and we will share in, in today about the income and economic strengthening, response to support spaces, and educational life skills. And we hope this session can be useful for all of you, as as well as the first first session that we have some days ago. So thank you all of you to stay here and to join us in this in this first in the second session. Going to you, Gloria. Thank you, Catalina, and thank you to all the UNICEF partners uh, for all the work, the joint work on on this um, on the webinars that we've been conducting. I will now like to invite Cassia Carvalho from the Global Partnership to End Violence uh, for a few greeting words. Cassia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to join you on behalf of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and Partners. Uh, every year, an estimate one billion children worldwide experience physical, sexual, or psychological violence. Uh, it means that one in every two children in every country and region, every religious and ethnic group, rich and poor alike, suffer violence every year. This pandemic of violence undermines all other investments in children, in health, education, and development, and erodes lifetime productivity and earning potentials. Uh, the End Violence Partnership was launched by the United Nations Secretary General in 2016 to address this unacceptable reality as an urgent global priority. Uh, we are the only global partnership and the largest fund solely dedicated to ending all forms of violence against children. And the partnership brings together around 750 organizations covering every continent and sector. To date, 38 countries have become end violence pathfinding countries. And uh, pathfinding countries are those whose leaders have publicly committed to end all forms of violence against children. These governments pledge within 18 months to have achieved six crucial milestones, which is to maintain their political commitment and leadership, to work across sectors with relevant national stakeholders, to collect and analyze data, develop an evidence-based costed national action plan, to implement the national action plan, and then to evaluate the national action plan, integrate the learnings, and restart the cycle. On the technical side, INSPIRE 7 evidence-based strategies have been critical to inform and structure those national action plans and have facilitated countries' efforts to prevent and respond to violence against children. 
Pathfinding countries have used inspired strategies to understand the drivers of violence and to structure country level efforts for prevention and response. Inspire has proven uh, to be key in unlocking the political will and coordination to champion an, a holistic approach across sectors and ministries to make real progress in anti violence against children adapted for their own particular country context. We hope to hear more about the role of different sectors and the importance of working together in today's presentation. Critically, anti-violence against children must be a shared national commitment and priority to unlock the investment and technical capabilities needed to impact children's lives. To strengthen efforts to end violence against children, the partnership encouraged the government to work uh, hard across sector in hopefully an, a, in a costed and evidence-based form. Uh, we hope this series of Inspire webinars can initiate or strengthen ongoing national dialogues and reflections in your countries, and the partnership and its members stand ready to support you and address this urgent and unacceptable situation to ensure that every child across your country can grow up in a safe, secure and nurturing environment. Thank you for your attention and your engagement and for all the work each one of you does every day to protect children from violence. We look forward to today's sessions and for future engagements. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cassia. Thank you for, for giving us that comprehensive introduction. Uh, for some of you, if this is your first webinar, we are um, finalizing a series of webinars. If you have been here uh, before in the previous webinars, uh, we really thank you and appreciate your commitment um, to the work. Well, I don't want to delay of us getting into um, into the content, but I do want to review that the strategies that have been previously uh, spoken about, presented throughout the webinars, which are recorded and can be found on, on the PAHO website, simply Googling PAHO um, Inspire Caribbean, for example, you may be able to find them. If not, you can reach out directly to us. We can send you the recordings of the previous webinars. We have already covered the strategy implementation and enforcement of laws, norms and values, safe environments, parent and caregiver support. Today in, the, in our last uh, session, we will be covering income and economic strengthening, and we have uh, a representative from the World Bank. We will then have response and support services, which will be conducted by our colleague from PAHO. And finally, we would have education and life skills that will be presented by our colleague uh, from uh, the Safe to Learn Secretariat. We will also um, hope to have, it's being planned, we will be updating you um, as the program goes along, uh, a country example. So this is what we have in store uh, for today. And we would like to invite our first presenter of today, Mr. Manuel Contreras Urbina from the World Bank, who will be speaking on the Inspire strategy of income and economic strengthening. Manuel? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. My name is Manuel Contreras Urbina. I'm a gender-based violence specialist for Latin American Caribbean region uh, at the World Bank. And I'm very um, happy to be part of this workshop. Thank you to Pajo and to UNICEF for the invitation and all uh, the colleagues. So um, I have a presentation. Is, would that be possible to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to because we you signed on as a panelist. Yes. Can you see it there? It's coming. Sorry, my internet is very slow because I'm in the field right now, but um, is that working? Yes. yes. Awesome. So I want to um, talk about the importance of the 
Uh, one of the strategies of Inspire that it focus mainly on the um, basically uh, empowering, e economically empowering uh, individuals, families, and particularly women, and how these can have like important and positive effects for um, prevention of violence against children. There is we have already some evidence that shows that uh, about the importance of this component in order to um, prevent situations of, of violence against children. And thus, uh, we are going to show some of these interventions, actions that are conducted that have shown some um, I would say like, uh, so some evidence, there are not much evidence in the world, there are not that many studies, but the the, the, the first studies that have um, focus on, on this part have, have shown that programs um, that are designed in the right way with a gender focus uh, can have like a positive uh, outcomes for the life of, of, of children. Um, so basically, the this uh, component of Inspire, the objective is to improve families, economic security, and stability, and how this can reduce, as I mentioned before, intimate partner violence and also reduce um, child maltreatment. So the interventions to strengthen um, the economic, the strengthen income and other economic aspects can benefit boys and girls, as I mentioned before, and decrease this child maltreatment. And especially, um, as I said, to have this gender focus is extremely, extremely important in the, uh, in the programs to strengthen the financial situation of women and the households in ways that can prevent uh, child care abuse and neglect. This uh, gender focus is not only to support women in the economic empowerment, but also to bring to these um, economic uh, programs issues related to gender inequality in, and address at the household level aspects with, with, uh, around the importance of uh, power dynamics and reduction of, of, uh, of gender-based violence in general. And also, of course, reduction of uh, violence against children as a way to discipline children, to punish children. So um, what are the possible effects um, of the economic empowerment programs on families on the reduction of violence against children. Well, as I said, there can be decrease in physical violence in childhood exercised by father, mothers, or other caregivers. Decre decreases the situations of intimate partner violence and therefore uh, situations of boys and girls at home witness um, um, intimate partner violence. Um, it can decrease situations of early marriage and forced marriage of girls. And in general have the potential to also create some changes in the social norms and attitudes that disapprove in general intimate partner violence and child maltreatment. What kind of programs are these? Well, we, we uh, in uh, evidence and, and, and show that there are three kind of uh, main main programs that are delivered in, in, in to, to empower the households and power, uh, economically empowered women that have shown some positive outcomes. One is cash transfers. Um, in can be conditional or unconditional cash transfers. The second one is group savings and loans associations combined with gender norm and equality training. 
And the other one is a microfinance combined also with gender norms and equality training. So as you see, um, in general, we, 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 we see a positive uh, outcome just for the fact to, to give some economic empowerment to the households and women. However, um, adding a gender, gender equality aspect to this, to these um, economic actions really provides another level of um, of engagement and reduce the potential the engagement in, of, of the households and the families and uh, in terms of like the importance to to manage uh, uh, the 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 household uh, funds or the household assets, but also it's uh, important to reduce the the inequality that can create violence against uh, uh, women and that uh, potentially uh, violence against children. Also, these type of programs have uh, the opportunity to empower girls at, and adolescent and girls at the extent to reduce situations of child marriage, uh, dowry, and all that kind of like uh, other potential uh, negative situations that are detrimental for women, and, and especially uh, young women, adolescent and girls. Um, so this, uh, and also, and I remember what I was going to say, to avoid potential backlashes because there is some uh, um there's been some some evidence also that shows that some of these programs can potentially create a backlash in the household when uh, there is like uh, some um assets funds provided to women and then there can be a potential backlash in terms of like the men, the husbands, the partners, the male partners feel threatened for that situation in and threatened in the in the in the power dynamics and they uh, exacerbate more violence against women and children. But that's why it's important that these in most of the cases these economic uh, interventions are together with some uh, components of um, sensitization, awareness of gender equality. So there is some like, uh, just to show uh, with evidence of what I just mentioned, the impact of cash, trans of cash transfers on intimate partner violence. There is like a now reviews about different studies um, in the world about this. And they show basically that in most of cases, we can see a decrease of violence with cash transfers. That's in general. However, as I mentioned, when we see this mix, mix um, results that are in like few cases, but still is related to this potential backlash about these economic empowerment programs don't show any change or then or potentially they uh, in some better cases we haven't seen much but a potential increase of violence but um evidence at the moment shows basically like a very very clear uh, path of decrease of intimate partner violence with cash transfers in terms of like um, uh, like a saving and loans program, uh, that also has uh, shown uh, reductions of violence in some in some studies. Again, there is no much evidence around this, but the the evidence that exists, they have shown that um, thanks to this program, there is a reduction of violence against women in general um, with uh, 
villa saving and loans programs that is uh, also again combined with um, interventions related to gender uh, gender equality awareness and there is here this program that uh, shown very important results this this was this program was um, has actually inspired many other economic empowerment programs this was one of the pioneer interventions about microcredit in in that was conducted in south africa that show how a um, microcredit program combined with this gender equality program reduce a lot the situations of intimate partner violence at that time they did not me measure the impact directly of violence against children but we seen that there is a clear association about reduction of intimate partner violence and again reduction of violence against children and children as witnessing situations of violence but also as um, as direct victims of violence um and more recently there has been some uh, evidence about how cash transfer programs have also some specific impact in violence against children there is like a, a study about um, in sub-saharan africa about how this has impact clearly in the sexual exploitation and abuse of adolescent girls about they being more economically empowered and that helped to reduce these situations of sexual exploitation in the communities. Um, there also, there have been also some studies that um, show the impact uh, in, in violence against children as well as, as violence against women in the, in the, in the households, intervention with the households and the potential mechanism for the impact i mean overall most of the stories again are being more a uh, of, of economic empowerment aimed to measure the reduction of intimate partner violence but we've seen that this reduction and reduction in poverty related is in stress inside the household potentially also have this positive outcome for children and also uh, some of these uh, mechanisms of impact is increased skills to manage stress and promoting freedom from conflict within household members, having more like um, assets, having more resources that uh, has a, a real impact for the entire household. In the region in Latin American Caribbean, there are not many uh, studies that that we know uh, that have shown this impact but there is like a very um, rigorous study this, this is a very famous study in 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 the region in ecuador that, that uh, of very very well-known researchers that have shown how the um the effect of cash transfer has in the households, especially again in intimate partner violence, but how this decrease uh, controlling behaviors um, has some and has some like um, impact in the in the in, in some of the in some types of violence in the household. So again, there is not much evidence outside, but uh, there is a a clear path about how these types of interventions and again having like a, having some gender lens in these interventions potentially have some uh, pot positive outcomes for the household including the reduction of violence against children thank you Thank you so much, Manuel, and, and for having covered um, the latest evidence um, on this type of strategy. And you you um, covered specifically three areas um, 
that uh, that have been studied and also mentioned that we don't have a lot of research in our in our region. Um, we like to open up um, the the uh, opportunity for questions. If you have a question currently, the best way would be if you could place it on the Q and A button. If there is a question for Manuel, this is an opportunity to. Um, any any type of question that his presentation might have um, triggered any um, doubts we you know we gather that in the region of the Caribbean there hasn't been uh, put forth any uh, studies but there are probably experiences if there are also experiences or um, that that you might be aware of please also feel free to, to share with us. Um, I think that would be interesting. I think there, as we know, and I see many of you coming from the different countries, from different, from ministries of health, but also from community-based organizations, from faith-based organizations, that sometimes there are programs that are happening in the community, but they might not be studied under you know, an academic um, institution under a, 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 um, a research protocol, but those experiences might be happening. What we're trying to promote is that we are knowledgeable about what evidence does exist in this regard um, in terms of income and, um, and economic strengthening and what effect that might have uh, among uh, families, women and children and how that has uh, that repercussion. Um, oh, very interesting question. So we have uh, Marvit uh, Fear. Uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce your last name. The question, uh, Manuel, is do you have any explanations or any um, um, studies that have been reported on the reduction of intimate partner violence from cash remittances? So those that um, have relatives abroad and are sending them financial support through cash remittances. Any any um, any word on on this aspect, Manuel? Yeah, this is a very 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 interesting question. Um, I I remember some studies in in. Um, in, in actually in, in my country in Mexico because this, this is a very important thing and considering all the the the, the current context um, um, but yes there is some uh, there is no much more evidence but overall is the the uh, there is like a same the same pattern about how this um, like cash that the household receives has a positive in, impact in general in the reduction of, of violence. Um, again, there, there is no much more evidence uh, and sometimes there can be a potential backlash, but overall the evidence say that yes, there is like a, a positive um, uh, in Have we lost Manuel or oh, has our has, has our we lost, no, we lost him. Oh, okay. Let's give him a couple of seconds because this he did say he was joining us from the field. But that was uh that was thank you for that question. So many in so many of our countries, um there are um this is a very important source of income for, for families, for women. So thank you a little bit that there hasn't been um, studies per se. There is, there were, as you mentioned, knowledge of, of some um, that might be looked at, but this is maybe also an important research question in our region specifically. Um, we have another question, uh, uh, Brita also. I'm sorry, Brita, would you like to uh, add to it? Thank you. No, 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 no ads for me. Huh? Oh, I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. It, there's a little note on the on the question and answer. We have uh, another. Um... 
I'm sorry. Oh, Manuel, I think you're I back. Was disconnected for a second. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Is that the internet is terrible today here? In um, so I really apologize. So, anyways, just to say that I'm happy to share some of these uh, uh, evidence uh, studies are, are around this. Thanks. Thank you. And there's a very interesting comment um, from our colleague um, that re recently there we, we had, as many of you are aware, a symposium on violence as a public health issue in the Caribbean. And a former school principal highlighted um, that a useful approach was exploring the construction of masculinities in high risk areas. And um, Avi continues that the Manuel's suggestion um, aligns with this with this comment that was presented. I think there is also, of course, all those intersections. Uh, and, and you did address uh, some of the issues around economic and economic strengthening and where there has been some backlash observed. And uh, I think there this is an interesting thought. Uh, anything to add, anything that you might found in the research as it relates directly to the studies and masculinity um, constructions? I, I'm not completely sure if I hear the whole thing because again, I was disconnected, but I, I just want to add again about the importance that some of these economic um, empowerment interventions go together uh, with programs around gender awareness and gender equality. I think that's key to potentially, and that can include, of course, the topic of men and masculinities, but others more about power dynamics in general in the relationships. That's key to prevent any potential backlash on this, in these programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. And thank you for joining us from the field and against the odds of, uh, you know, a weak connectivity. Uh, we, we were able to have you fully. Thank you so much. So, and, and thank you for the comments and questions. We're going to now move on to our next presenter who will be um, addressing the Inspire strategy on response and support services. We have with us uh, our, the advisor on um, violence and uh, many different types of violence. Uh, please forgive me, my colleague, Brita Byer from the Washington headquarters of PAHO. Brita. Great. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Gloria. Um, it's a pleasure to be connected to everybody again. And thank you so much for participating. Uh, my job is to briefly present um, the next strategy of Inspire, which is about response and support service, the R strategy, um, which is a very important one. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Okay, um, and it's it is so important because I'm sure we can all agree that when um, children, when women, when boys and girls um, of different ages experience violence, experience abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, or emotional, and we're talking really about a very large group. Um, Cassia mentioned in her opening work, one billion in the world that experienced this. So um, when a child, uh, an adolescent experiences violence, it is critical that they have access to needed support and care um, and that is so important because we know that when we have strong, high quality support and response services, then we can achieve reductions in the recurrence of violence um, in the short term, reductions in trauma symptoms from post-traumatic stress to depression to anxiety, um, often reductions in sexual transmitted infections and reproductive health outcomes in cases of sexual violence um, that we can prevent, um, and reductions in victimization or even the potential of reducing the chance of perpetration of violence later in life. We know violence intersects with each other, so when we when we um, 
identify a survivor of violence uh, and intervene in an effective, high quality manner, then we have the potential to reduce the chance that they will experience violence again or that they will become a perpetrator of violence later in life themselves. So this way, it is about response services that I'm talking about, but I'm also talking about the potential to prevent escalation or other currents of violence. Um, and I do want to quickly talk about the reality on the ground. And I hope that you'll add a little bit to the Q and A's or the comments on like how you see it in your context. What we know is that of all children and adolescents who have experienced this violence, we're talking about a certain group. Of those, we're talking even about less than those that experience violence will tell anyone. And sometimes it might be a family member, a friend, a service. Even less than those, and that's why the, the triangle keeps going up, even less than those uh, will actually seek help, including from services, from formal services. And even less, and we're talking about a really small percentage now of those that have experienced violence, that have told somebody, that have sought help, a very small percentage of those will receive quality care and support. Um, and this is really what we want to turn around, right? Uh, that triangle. Um, and I want to stress um, the slide talks uh, is using data from the VAC studies, uh, the Violence Against Children survey that was mentioned the last time as well, which is a great instrument to have really good data to help us guide uh, um, interventions and the strategies and more broadly in, um, uh, in Inspire Adaptation. Um, PAHO and partners um, a couple of years ago launched this report on how the region is doing, the region of the Americas is doing and implementing Inspire. Um, and one of the data points that was very um, um, noteworthy to me was that the big difference that we saw among countries reporting that a certain intervention or strategy um, was receiving support at the national level versus perceptions about the strategy or intervention reaching all or nearly all in need. Uh, and you can see, um, and I've just selected some of the interventions that are incorporated into the response strategy of Inspire is that what there are big, big differences between the green bar and the blue bar, which basically means that even where you have 90% of countries reporting that they do have at the national level clinical services for sexual violence, of those people um, that responded to this um, survey, to this report, only 26% of countries um, perceive these very services to be reaching all or nearly all in need. So there's a huge gap that we need to be filling to make sure everybody has access to needed care and support. And that is really the heart of the strategy. This is why the strategy exists, which has the objective to improve access to good quality health, social welfare, protection, criminal justice, support services for all children and adolescents who need them. Um, in order to, you know, deal with the both short-term, medium-term, as well as long-term impacts of violence. And the strategy puts emphasis on two equally important aspects, access to the services and quality of the services. Um, as I think we've mentioned before in the very, very first session, um, this strategy gives emphasis um, to um, four types of interventions that we can consider that are based on the evidence that includes counseling and therapeutic approaches, clinical inquiry to identify survivors of violence combined with interventions, treatment program for juvenile offenders, and foster care interventions. Um, and just to give one example, what we're talking about, Inspire is based on the evidence because we think it's important that we invest in interventions and approaches that have a backing in the evidence so that we know that work. Um, and just to give one example of that evidence, um, using one from the, the R study, the response and support services, um, evidence shows that for example, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which is sort of part of the intervention that I mentioned earlier around counseling and therapeutic approaches, um, is effective. It is so effective that both in individual therapy as well as group therapy, there, there's clear proof of 
um, a reduction in trauma symptoms, a reduction in um, in impairments. Um, so this is a great area to invest in because we know it works. Um, importantly, there are also examples now um, um, across the world of of providing this kind of service, um, CBT or trauma-focused CBT through lay workers. That means that we don't necessarily need to rely on specialized mental health services and, and, and mental health specialists in all settings. But this type of intervention can also be adapted to more resource constrained settings where we can use lay workers to provide this kind of very effective interventions to survivors of violence. Um, within the R uh, strategy, um, we really want to um, build capacity to move towards a very comprehensive response and support framework for all children and adolescents that have been affected by violence. And within that, we're really talking about sort of four broad areas of action um, that I want to just briefly go through. The first one is really um, the challenge that faces all of us, regardless of which sector we work in or which institutions we work in. This is this vision of building a, a comprehensive and coordinated support system. Um, and that um, requires at a minimum interventions or collaboration by the health sector, by the justice system, by the protection and social welfare system. But there are many other actors that would probably likely fit into a, a, a comprehensive support system. Um, central to this, of course, coordination co collaboration structures that are supported by, on the one hand, strong sectoral work in each of these sectors. It is supported by um, legal and policy frameworks for, for both prevention and support, reference structures, protocols, um, intersectoral mechanisms to share information to, for joint planning, um, referral networks that allow seamless um, navigation, um, the child friendliness of services and strong, strong resources, both financial as well as human that have been appropriately trained to work together and provide comprehensive um, survivor-focused care and support. Um, and while each sector has its role and has a very important role that can be played by the next sector, I think there are some key principles that inspire the inspire package talks about that are relevant across sectors that I just want to talk about very briefly, um, including sort of what to do and what not to do. For example, in each sector uh, and across, you know, sort of a pathway of a survivor, it is critical that we don't pressure the survivor to disclose violence, that we empower them to come forward, that we don't force them to repeatedly share their story. Um, or, for example, this requires that services at the sort of on the ground are able to work together and share information while also respecting confidentiality and privacy, but enough so that they can work together around the survivor rather than re-traumatizing by forcing them to repeat the story. Um, it is critical that we don't judge the survivor, that we support them in what where they are at without discrimination, which really requires um, strong legal and policy frameworks and protocols of what to do and what not to do, but it also requires strong training for frontline providers to work together, to um, change their competences, to have the skills to provide non-judgmental, um, discrimination-free and uh, empathetic support. Um, the second area of attention in INSPIRE under the strategy is is the need to find out who needs help. That is like sort of the entry point. If we don't see, if we are not able to identify survivors of violence, ideally as early as possible, then violence will remain invisible and we, we will not necessarily have an opportunity to intervene. And um, this really, like now I'm really talking to health services. Health services have such an important role in identification. Um, they are very often an entry point for multi-sectoral support. They can be act like a doorway. Um, when I train health workers, I always say, like, think of yourself as a doorway. Either the doors open and the survivor walks through and has then access by extension to multi-sectoral support in the health system, but also in the justice system, by the police, by the social sector. Or the door can be closed. 
We can ignore that the survivor is in front of us. We can ignore signs and symptoms of violence and the survivor will not have access to care. This is why one of the interventions that is recommended by Inspire is clinical inquiry. A clinical inquiry is a way to identify at risk groups in the health system. It does not mean a universal screening. Uh, universal screening is, for example, when we ask every child that we see in health services the same question. No, the recommendation is that we use clinical inquiry. We ask uh, when we see signs um, and warning signals that could potentially be associated with violence. So it's a, it's a clinical judgment call to ask this question under certain conditions, including confidentiality and privacy. And it immediately needs to be followed by interventions. It is not enough to just identify. Identification is critical, but it needs to be supported by interventions. This, this is not easy. And this is why uh, PAHO, for example, in the health system recommends that every health system has strong health sector and clinical protocols that allow, uh, that spell out basically what a health worker should do and when to ask, how to ask, and what to do next. Similar protocols could be very useful for all sectors, both about sectoral work. For example, social sector services can also help with identification of cases of violence. Um, as well as specialized units uh, and trained staff, for example, specialized police units that allow for timely follow-up on certain cases. Um, the third area, uh, and it really, to me, the, these two go hand in hand. As I said, identification is not enough. We, yes, we, we find out who needs help, but then we immediately help that person, both immediately as well as in the medium and longer term. Um, and that might include assessment of their health status, documentation, first line support, clinical care, including for mental health, but also specialized clinical care for sexual violence. When it comes to sexual violence, we have a minimum number of hours that we can actually prevent the impact of violence, of sexual violence. Um, and to make the most out of this opportunity, we need to have a very strong, well-coordinated functioning system with highly trained providers. It is also includes things like counseling, therapeutic approaches. I've also mentioned the example of CBT and the opportunity we have there to really reduce trauma impacts. But it also means like thinking about potentially alternative care arrangements, including foster care, where social services have a key role or child-friendly justice processes and protection mechanisms that provide more targeted support to some groups. And within all of this, uh, again, um, this is not work that is necessarily, it might be led by a certain sector, uh, but almost every single intervention that is under the strategy requires um, coordination um, across sectors and across services. And that um, just reiterates the, the urgent need to strengthen um, service coordination and case management um, for survivors of violence that is really targeted to the needs of the individual and their preferences and their wishes. Um, and, and then the last area is uh, the, the importance of protecting children in conflict with the law. We know um, that children are lessened in many settings and may already uh, be engaged in violence. Um, they may already be in conflict with the law and we have an opportunity to intervene in that group to prevent escalation of violence, prevent further occurrence of violence and engagement with violence. Um, but to be able to do this, we need to strengthen working across sectors to support children, uh, whether this might be through alternative um, arrangements, supporting, for example, supported by social services, education, life skills, or other types of community-based services. It may require um, strengthening of treatment programs for children in the juvenile justice system. Um, it also very often includes the access to and quality of healthcare services for at-risk or detained children, including both reproductive as well as mental health services that are critical. Uh, including substance abuse um, care. Um, and 
and we have a real opportunity here through interventions in the justice system, in the social system, as well as the health system to make a difference and protect children in law and thus prevent further escalation of violence. And I'm going to end here. Um, this was a very quick overview of some of the evidence and some of the approaches that have been recommended by Inspire. But um, I would love or I would encourage you to um, to share your experience. I know this is an area where a lot of countries, where a lot of organizations have advanced on the ground, right? In services, whether this is health services, whether this is legal services, whether this is police um, services, whether it is uh, social services, protection. I'd love um, to hear some of your experiences, some, both sharing some of the challenges that you face, um, but also um, some of the interventions that you have been working with that, that, that make a difference from your perspective. So please use the Q&A button or um, to share your experiences or ask the questions or make a comment. Thanks so much. Over to you, Gloria. Thank you so much, Brita. And uh, yes, we we noticed that, um, and apologies, because I know we saw a couple of hands um, in the uh, from the participants. We've also encouraged people to use the Q&A, but we're doing well on time because we made the decision that we're taking questions, we're taking comments uh, immediately after each presentation. So. Uh, we still have a hand up and we want to try if the system cooperates um, that um, Miss Judy Thomas, if you would like to still have a question, even if it's from the, I don't know, we have Manuel, I was going to say, we, even if it's from the previous session, uh, but any comments, oh, I see that the hand is down. Um, please let us know if you have a question or a comment. Um, and I do know we we will will continue with the program, but please keep your, you know, your comments, your questions, uh, also in the QA. It is important to hear from you. So if I don't see, and please help me, my colleagues, uh, any other questions? I see that our hands, uh, there are no longer any hands up, um, but we maintain it's an open and running forum in the Q&A button. So let's um, uh, thank you, Rita, um, thank you, Rita, for that uh, overview on the response and support services. So while you think of some questions or comments as we go along, um, I will short in, in a second introduce our next speaker, but I want to make sure that I mentioned that we do have um, a comment on the on the Q&A uh, from Jamaica in the Child uh, Diversion Program. Uh, and children in conflict with the law are involved in mentorship, psychological intervention, and counseling. So it uh, includes several of the elements that were mentioned today, and we'd love to, to learn more. Thank you so much, Marvette, for the, uh, for the comment. So let's uh, move on to our next presenter from um, that will be presenting on the next uh, Inspire strategy, which is education and life skills. And for this uh, specific strategy, we have Ms. Catherine Flagotier from the Safe to Learn Secretariat, which is now based at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And um, we're very delighted to have Catherine with us, please. Good morning. Good morning. Perfect. Yes. Sorry. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for inviting me to present at this critical webinar. Uh, as a, thanks so much to the organizers. So, as mentioned, I'm working for the Safe to Learn Secretariat. Safe to Learn is a global initiative that brings together 14 partners at the global level. Uh, that are united under the same aim to end violence, the violence that happens in schools, around the schools, on the way to and from schools, in online activities related to children's education, and also to end violence using schools as an entry point. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present the Education and Life Skills Strategy, so the E in INSPIRE today. 
The aim of this uh, strategy, the objective of this strategy is to increase um, children access to more effective gender equitable education and social emotional learning and also life skills training and ensure the school environments are safe and enabling. And um, this uh, strategy is based, uh, the rationale behind these strategies is threefold. First of all, the fact that uh, participation in schools can be protective for children uh, and can protect them from both experiencing violence as well as perpetrating violence. Secondly, schools are not always safe. So the strategy recognizes that violence, children can be victims of violence also in schools, both by their peers or by adults. And so it is important under this strategy also to work to ensure that uh, the safety of schools and uh, to ensure safe and supporting environments. Schools are safe and supporting environments. And lastly, schools can be important entry points for the implementation of prevention programs to prevent violence in other areas also of settings of children's lives, as well as uh, for uh, responding to violence. So educators and school staff can have an important role in identifying cases of, of violence or children at risk of violence and in providing a first response and referring children to uh, response services, sorry. Uh, so under these strategies, there are a variety of um, approaches um, that can be categorized uh, under two big umbrellas of interventions. We have system-wide approaches and programmatic approaches. And uh, both these types of approaches are important and complementary. So the system-wide approaches are approaches that intervene at the system level. So we have here um, approaches that intervene to increase the participation in schools. So to tackle the barriers that some children face vis-a-vis uh, -vis their participation, enrollment and participation in schools and support children and families to, uh, through policies uh, to overcome these barriers. And here we also have uh, system approaches uh, to guarantee the, so the safety of schools and uh, having schools have, uh, as an enabling uh, environment for children. For example, we have uh, um, the importance of having national child protection policies for children or of integrating violence prevention and response within uh, major education sector um, policies and plans. And then we have another group of approaches that are programmatic approaches. And these type of approaches can be implemented at various levels. They can be implemented at the national level, but also at the local level or at the school level in individual schools. And uh, these approaches uh, have different aims. Some of these approaches, they, they, all, they all focus on helping children and adolescents building the skills they need in order to uh, develop positive relationships and, uh, and, uh, and, and self-protection, but they have different aims. So we have a group of interventions that aim to um, strengthen life skills and social skills of students. Then we have another group of intervention that aim to help children protecting themselves from sexual abuse. And lastly, we have interventions targeting adolescents in order to prevent intimate partner um, violence. So uh, what are the potential outcomes of these approaches? Um, under the system level approaches, we have the interventions that aim to increase children's participation in school. And here potential outcomes are increased participation in formal education, a reduced risk of participation by the students in youth violence, and reduce risk of child marriage and intimate partner violence. Then with regards to, this, to the approaches that aim to build a safe and enabling school environment for all children, possible outcomes are a reduction in peer violence and in bullying, a reduction in, uh, in violent discipline by teachers and school staff, reduction in sexual abuse, exploitation, and uh, sexual harassment in school, and an improved sense of safety in school. The improved sense of safety is also 
very important uh, for children, um, including for their education outcomes. And then the third group of interventions, the programmatic type of uh, approaches, uh, can result in an increased self-esteem, protective and prosocial behaviors, increased disclosure and help-seeking behaviors by children that have experienced violence, in reduced bullying and physical violence, and also in reduced intimate partner violence, as well as sexual abuse and exploitation. And this is just one example. There has been a, a systematic review that has looked at, at, that has looked at hundreds of uh, interventions aiming to uh, strengthen life skills and um, social emotional training programs. And uh, the evidence shows that these interventions uh, are effective in reducing aggressive and disruptive behavior in schools. The evidence shows a reduction of 25% when uh, the interventions targeted uh, all students and an intervention of 33% for programs that uh, targeted selected students at high risk students. And then uh, we don't have time to go through uh, uh, all the types of interventions that are and have been implemented around the world and prove effective. And for this reason have been integrated into the Inspire package. But uh, let me just say that there are many of them, luckily, um, of course, not enough, but there is enough evidence uh, to hope that we can do something useful for children at the school level as well as system level. So I would encourage uh, all of you to go and, uh, and, um, and read the Inspire technical package, which provides a description of these selected interventions that have proved effective. But uh, let me just perhaps talk about uh, one of them. This is teacher training. Teacher training has been implementing implemented in a variety of contexts. And I'm choosing these because the role of the education sector and of schools and of teacher and school staff is fundamental in order to both uh, protect and prevent violence uh, within the schools, but also in order to be able to use schools and education um, as, a, as, a, as a tools for a transformative role and to prevent um, violence against children also in other settings. So teacher play, can play a very critical role, but for this role, for, for them to be able to play this role, they have to be empowered, they need to be trained on how to do so. So effective training can uh, um, help teacher to uh, avoid uh, using um, um, corporal punishment and violent uh, types of discipline and to use instead a positive discipline and positive technique to manage the classroom behavior. Also teacher trainings can help children uh, examine their assumptions, the values, the beliefs, their own, uh, own experience of violence because we, we shouldn't uh, forget that teachers are part and schools are part of the wider society. So children, uh, student, um, sorry, teachers are also influenced by the social, the gender norms, um, the value and the beliefs of the, of the society to which they belong to. Training can also help them recognize, and this is also very important and links well with the previous presentation on, on, on response services. It can help them uh, recognize the signs and, um, and indicators of violence and, um, and uh, in uh, uh, helping them respond to the violence and referring, provide a first response to, to violence cases and referring children um, to, to to, to service. So it's important to have focal points in school and a referral pathways for referring violence cases outside the school. And also children can en help engaging students in violence prevention activities and uh, as well as their community. And also um, know, um, learn how to be inclusive in their, in their, in their teaching and learning. 
some considerations for implementation. So we have seen two different kinds of approaches. So as I said, they're both important. It's important to have a system approach and work at the level of laws and policies and at the level of the education system and also at the level of the linkages between the education system and schools and the other uh, systems. Um, including child protection, health, et cetera. Um, but it's also important to have intervention at the school level. So the education sector has a very critical role uh, to play, as I already said, and, um, and um, is accountable for the violence that takes place within the schools. And so it's important for education sector to incorporate violence prevention and response into education sector policies, plans, and budget, as we have already seen. Uh, another aspect is about humanitarian context. I won't go through it now, but it's important to say that it's very um, that uh, life skills interventions, having safe spaces for children to continue their education um, can be very important in humanitarian context. So this type of intervention shouldn't stop um, in case of a, of, a, of a humanitarian context, but actually can be very important to strengthen children's resilience, building the life and social skills and for peace building. And then it's also important uh, to intervene at the level of online violence. So children are more and more, on, more online, um, including sometimes in the activities related with their education. So it's important to consider the risk of cyberbullying, but also other types of violence that children may encounter online and establish policies as well as supportive interventions as part of this uh, education and life skills strategy. And last but not least, intervention need to be age appropriate and uh, culturally relevant. This is not only for this education and life skills strategy, but uh, under many other strategies for child protection. Um, so let me also say when these type of interventions um, work best. Uh, as I said, they work best it's important uh, to integrate them into education policy, into teacher training, into curricula. It's also, evidence also shows that having a whole school approach is critical. So uh, um, having a whole school perspective when looking at the school culture and including the, the various actors that are included, that are involved in schools, um, the students themselves, child participation, the, the the teachers and the school staff, but also parents can play a very important role. Um, it's also important um, um, in order for having effective intervention to um, have and encourage a reflection on the gender norms and, um, and on the social norms that are at the roots of uh, violence often and to engage also the school management and the school governing, governing boards in intervention. And finally, training teachers as we, are, as we have already seen. So um, here I would like to make linkages with the other inspired strategies. So these education life skills strategies, of course, is, uh, is, uh, is critical. And um, education can have a very transformative role to prevent violence within schools and outside the schools. But um, this inspired strategy should not be seen alone. Um, it comes and reinforces the other uh, six inspired strategies, as well as efforts that go beyond violence prevention and response. For example, uh, we mentioned a positive discipline, and it, it's important then to have uh, laws uh, also to have uh, um, uh, within the legal framework, uh, laws that prohibit the use of violent punishment by teachers. Uh, there are also other linkages with the other strategies. We won't go perhaps through all of them. I'm not sure there is time, but what I would like to mention is again uh, the linkage perhaps with the response and support strategy. So the fact that educators and uh, school staff are often, you know, people to whom the, the violence is disclosed. So they can be trained to identify cases of violence and they can be part of referral 
networks and first line response to violence. And also, um, let me talk one minute about the linkages with other agendas, a broader health social economic agenda. Uh, because uh, of course, um, uh, being protected from violence is a child right. So that's why violence should stop, first of all, it's a human rights violation, but also it affects other types of children's rights, including the rights to education. So uh, we have the evidence now that proves that violence against children, including violence against children in, in school, has uh, negative um, outcomes on children learning and also on their participation in school. There has been a, um, an investment case that has been developed by the World Bank a couple of years ago, published also with Safe to Learn and End Violence, that also proves that um, violence in school is also a very high economic cost, uh, which is estimated by the World Bank to be around $11 trillion. So uh, we can see how violence including violence in school links uh, with many areas of children's lives and also how important the various inspired strategies are um, in connection to the education and life skill strategy. Finally, I wanted to take the opportunity uh, um, to, uh, I've already said work for Safe to Learn. I wanted to introduce our initiative. So we bring together 14 partners. Um, there are experts in education, child protection, but also in health and violence prevention, including um, UN, some UN agencies, the civil society, organizations, global partnerships, the private sector, and the UN Special Representative on Violence Against Children. This is an initiative that what is established in 2019 because there has been a global recognition that school and education and protection uh, cannot be seen as isolated spheres. So, um, and that schools and education can play a very important role in preventing uh, um, violence against children. So uh, we are here to contribute to the implementation of the INSPIRE strategies. And we have also been inspired by the INSPIRE strategies. So we have developed a series of additional tools that uh, aim to complement this INSPIRE strategy on education and life skills and um, providing further uh, links to uh, documents uh, that can be read by policymakers and used by policymakers and uh, um, and um, and colleagues working at the country at the field level to prevent and response and respond to violence in and through education, including a diagnostic tool that countries and governments can use to assess where the country stands in relation to the prevention and uh, um, and response to violence in schools. And, um, and can help to have a national uh, uh, dialogue based on findings and, uh, and, um, and identify recommendations for improvement. And lastly, there, one of our members, UNICEF, that hosts our secretariat, has uh, um, undertaken a global review of interventions um, a couple of years ago. These are interventions implemented by UNICEF, and some of them uh, confirm what is already in the SPIRE technical package. For example, there is a couple of interventions that, that have proved to work um, and uh, uh, kind of uh, including in power in Malawi um, and Kenya that is also mentioned in the SPIRE technical package um, that aims to provide skills to children, particularly girls, to um, protect themselves from violence, but also new interventions that have proved effective. For example, teacher training in a couple of countries, including Cambodia and uh, Indonesia, uh, where teacher training has been evaluated and uh, uh, is proved um, effective. Thank you very much once again for the Thank opportunity you. to be here today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you very much. We, uh, in, in, um, for the sake of time, we're going to move on 
to a country example, because we feel that it is, this is really you know, one of the highlights of, so of the webinar in addition to what has been presented. And we are going to move to Jewel Cross from UNICEF Guyana. Please, um, Ms. Jewel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Or it is afternoon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm Jewel Cross, and I'm beginning to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, from the beginning. All right, so... Okay, thank you. I'm the Youth and Adolescent Development Officer in UNICEF. Uh, let me see, yeah, <laughs> there, there we go. And um, many thanks for inviting the Guyana office to share its experience. Do forgive me if you hear a bit of sound in the background, but currently I'm in Panama doing um, on another workshop, <laughs> well, a meeting. So do excuse any, um, any noise. I'll try to go through as quickly as possible because um, much of what I have said was already, what I'm gonna say, some of it has already been said. Okay, how do I do this now? Okay, good. So I want us to begin by thinking where are, the ch where are children found? Where are young people found? They are found in schools. They are found out of school. Those who have either dropped out or those who have left school. They are found in faith-based organizations, in detention centers, in state care, such as orphanages. And we have street children as well. Knowing where they're found, um, we want to talk about what do they need? What do young people, what do adolescents need? And they need a safe and supportive environment with protection and opportunities for development. They need education to suit their needs. They need life skills. And I have bolded the life skills component because many times, especially in our part of the world, a lot of emphasis is placed on education because um, it, there is a rush to pass as many exams as possible and so on. But without balancing that with or complementing the education with life skills, young people continue to be vulnerable. So um, young people also need information and skills to interact with the world. They need health services and counseling, employability skills, and in the world of technology, they need technology and digital skills. Having said that, we can I see this slide um, kind of identifies some of the challenges young people have, some of the behaviors in which they, you know, possibly indulge in. I wouldn't dwell too much on that. But my, um, we have already spoken about what are life skills. We talk about it being, um, for positive behavior. Um, it's a group of psychosocial competencies, interpersonal skills that help people make informed decisions to think critically and creatively com communicate effectively, among others. So why education and, and, and life skills? We know that we need to ensure that the school environments are safe and enabling, increase participation in school and help children to protect themselves from sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, violence in schools. And in many cases, um, it feels that or to understand what, about what, what life skills are. So, um, Life skills give the children the courage, you know, to speak up and to be
be involved in activities which they can protect themselves. So for the entry points for life skills, we talk about the schools, the community, faith-based organizations, using sports, using culture and music. And Ghana has done this over the, before COVID especially. <laughs> um, we know education empowers um, the children and in the Inspire Handbook, we see that um, it is stated that quality education helps children acquire knowledge, acquire skills and experiences that build resilience and reduce the risk factors. Um, our emphasis too is to ensure the safe and engaging learning environments where children will not only succeed academically, but they will also grow socially and you know, avoid the unpleasant experiences with um, associated with violence and bullying and perpetrating of violence against each, each other. So the research has shown that why we must teach um, life skills in schools. It is because um, several reasons. They are learned more easily when an individual is young. When the child is young, it is easier for them to, um, to learn these skills. And these skills l last them for a lifetime. Um, it is a time that allows the child to learn values and attitudes. Uh, it allows them to negotiate um, and not to be afraid to speak up. So the evidence has shown that the competence in the use of life skills can delay the onset of drugs, um, drug use, prevent high risk sexual behavior, facilitate anger management, conflict resolution, improve academic performance, and promote positive social adjustments that allows one to deal effectively with the demands and challenges of everyday life. So let me get to it. How life skills are taught in schools in Guyana? It is done through two, mainly two, two programs which UNICEF supports. And that is the Health and Family Life Education, we call it HFLE program. And the second, well, now is the school's health clubs. What is HFLE? HFLE is a comprehensive life skills based program, which focuses on the development of the whole person. In Guyana, because the emphasis is on um, how to achieve a lot academically, in the beginning, not many persons were, you know, were taking the HFLE. Seriously, they were concentrating mainly on the topics or the content rather than the life skills, which will help the children um, learn more about the content in a way that they will be able to um, <clears throat> negotiate life. You know, it enhances the potential of young persons to become productive and contributing adults is a safe space actually to discuss social issues, including topical challenges such as violence, gender norms, harmful social norms, and bullying. Many children, when we talk with them, as we monitor the program, mo most children say that this is the best topic in school because it is a safe space which gives them an opportunity to express themselves, to express their own views. So it is a timetable subject in all primary schools and secondary schools, but for nursery, it is integrated. So the children learn um, in nursery school, they learn about HFLE um, in an integrated manner. Whereas for primary and secondary schools, it is taught as a separate subject, just like how you will teach math and science. Um, it is compulsory. It's a compulsory course that is offered at the Guyana Teachers Training College, which we know is the Cyril Potter Tra College of Education. And this is in order to allow the teacher to develop the competencies to teach the topic. Of course, uh, over the last 
15 to 20 years, we keep hearing the same thing that the teachers do not feel competent to discuss issues such as um, sexual and reproductive health. And in that instance, what you'll find is that you'll find um, they may team with the local health provider or a local NGO to cover those topics which they are um, not, which they are reluctant to <laughs> teach. So on one hand, you have this, the HFLE program, which is a compulsory program in primary and secondary schools as a separate topic. And that is mainly driven by the Ministry of Education. They have the curriculum, they have the, um, the, the learning aids and so on. But the secondary schools health club whereby life skills are also taught, it is a group of voluntary, um, is a voluntary grouping at the school and it comprises of students and teachers. Um, and other maybe um, persons with the experts. Now, why we like the school's health clubs is because it is driven by the students. It is not teacher driven or the Ministry of Education driven. It is the children themselves with the support of the Ministry of Health um, has, uh, they come together and they decide the topics that they're gonna talk about. They decide what are the issues that they need um, you know, help with. And many times it, it can be topical. So for instance, if there um, is an incident of say someone circulating pornography um, in the classroom, they can take that opportunity to talk about um, bullying and about um you know such those behaviors if <clears throat> there is um <clears throat> sorry violence in the in the school it, the young people will take that opportunity to address violence within the clubs and um <clears throat> and to use the approach of life skills because being topical is one thing having the um, having the issue that is very theoretical is one thing, but we want those children to apply the skills that they learn and have them say, how will I address this differently? What will I have done differently? Will I have done the same thing? So this slide here talks about ensuring the ownership of the school's health program. Um, it talks about opportunities for implementing activities in school as well as out of schools because they will make themselves available to do maybe say um, a street fair a, or a theater and something with entertainment to talk about or to bring to the attention of the student population a particular um, <clears throat> issue. So it is giving them that opportunity to plan. So they plan their, they plan their program themselves. They will only get assistance if they request that. And they also will know to go to the local health center, to go to the child protection agency within the area, to go to the local social worker so that you know, certain issues can be talked, can be discussed. Moving along, okay, I did say it consists of the teachers, staff members, counselors. Um, it forms, the children form a core group in their schools. And most interestingly, what I like about the school's health club structure is that over a period of time, they have room for peer educators. So there's a peer education program because remember, the information is being provided by the, peer, by the students themselves, unless it is a topic which they may want to have uh, expert help, that is when that person is invited. And of course, coming to the end, they cannot do this alone. 
So for the HFLE, as well as for the school's health club, there is a partnership in which they enter with um, the Ministry of Culture, of course, Education, Human Services, Labor, Health, the police, NGOs, and UN agencies. So um, it is coming together to address the violence in schools, to address um, when there is violence in schools, it is not only the education responsibility, Ministry of Education responsibility, but they will bring in the Ministry of Human Services. They will bring in also the Ministry of Health and the local NGOs who will assist the children in, you know, addressing these issues. So it's more of a partnership and that is what makes it work. And thank you. I'm sorry if I had to, if I rushed. Thank you, thank you, um, because you gave us uh, some very concrete um, examples of something that a health system, I'm sorry, a, a education system has done in one of our countries in the Caribbean. And so it, I think the value of putting it all together, where you bring, actually bring some of the strategies, uh, especially highlighting the education and life skills, but also that multi, multi-sector approach that you were showing us towards the end and how um, it, it has, it, it's working, it's being operationalized, it has the life skills uh, formal component in the curricula, as well as the school health clubs and how the children and the youth take ownership of those and yeah. evolves into the peer education program as well. So we're very, very thankful to you and to all the presenters that are bringing us to um, an end of this webinar series where we've covered the seven strategies uh, of Inspire. And this will not be the, the end of our, of our um, uh, involvement in this area, of course, all the Inspire partners are well committed to continuing to work together. This was, again, in introducing you to all the resources and in all the spheres. We thank all the participants that came from the different countries around the Caribbean, from the different um, areas, from ministries of education, social development, as well as community-based organization and faith-based organization from Anguilla, Anguilla Antigua, St. Vincent, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos, and I might have missed. Um, and of course, we had the example um, presented from Guyana. So we are a little over. We just want to thank you again. Please, um, we put some resources on the chat, which gives you the overall. And also, you, we contacted you via email because you had participated before. We will also make the recording available. And please stay in touch. Thank you um, and take care. Thank you for accompanying us today. Thank you to all the participants from the Inspire Partners. You made it this possible. Bye-bye. Thank you.